First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to present our work on OCTA characteristics of intraocular tumors. So our aim was to understand the OCTA characteristics of the intraocular tumors and also to assess the role of OCTA as a diagnostic agent in diagnosis of these tumors. So it's a retrospective case series of various intraocular tumors, which we classified as vascular, pigmented, and glial cell tumors. OCTA was captured with the TopCon DRI OCT Triton Plus. The images with significant motion artifact and masking due to overlaying retinal changes were excluded from the study. The key to image a retinal tumor is manual segmentation. So here we can see the difference. We can get such beautiful images only if we do a manual segmentation by segmenting both the layers in all the scans frame by frame. So coming to the vascular tumors, the retinal capillary hemangioblastoma. So this is a case of large retinal capillary hemangioblastoma in a known patient of VHL. So we can see that the tumor is characterized by presence of a compact vascular signal with hardly any intervening spaces. We can see very tiny intervening spaces, but it's predominantly vascular. So it's a compact vascular signal indicating its vascular origin. We can also see the draining vessel and the feeder vessels and its branches also. So in this fundus photograph, we can see a small retinal capillary hemangioblastoma, but we can't see any feeder vessel. But if we do an OCTA, it does show a feeder vessel, not just the feeder vessel to this tumor, but also a small tumor which was missed on color photograph and even on clinical examination. So OCTA can help in identification of smaller tumors which can be missed on clinical examination or color photo, but it has the limitation of only imaging the posterior pole, which will preclude its role as of now. So in this case, the diagnosis is quite certain. It's an exophytic form of juxtapapillary retinal capillary hemangioblastoma. On OCTA, as we see in a peripheral retinal capillary hemangioblastoma, it has a compact vascular signal with hardly any intervening spaces. But what about this? Here we see a grayish tumor, which is subretinal in location, and it's juxtapapillary. We don't know what is the diagnosis, but when we do an OCTA, we can see a retinal feeder vessel feeding the tumor. And if we just ignore these projection artifacts from the superficial retinal vessels, we can see that the tumor is composed of a compact vascularity. So OCTA give a hint to the diagnosis that it is a vascular tumor with a retinal feeder. So it is most likely an endophytic form of juxtapapillary retinal capillary hemangioblastoma. Coming to the choroidal hemangioma, so as Madam has already described, we can see that there is in choroidal hemangioma, it is definitely seen distinctly from the normal choroid. The vasculature of the choroidal hemangioma is definitely seen distinctly from the normal choroid, so we can map the margins of the tumor. Other than that, it consists of irregular network of vessels, both large caliber vessels and the small caliber vessels. The caliber of the vessels do vary from location to location. So there are intervening signal void areas, which would be probably the interstitial tissue. We can see three cases of solitary choroidal hemangioma. The two on the left, they were associated with an exudative retinal detachment, but this particular tumor was inactive. When we do an OCTA, we can see that the intervening dark signals were quite enormous in case with the inactive tumor, but in the active tumor, the intervening signal void areas were very less. So probably this would also indicate the vascular density or the flow characteristic within the tumor, so that if we see a lot of bright signals within the tumor, it would indicate the tumor activity, but if we see a large number of signal void areas, it would indicate an inactive tumor. This is a fundus photo of a gentleman with right-sided facial, facial pore pain stain, so we need to exclude a diffuse choroidal hemangioma in the right eye. But on fundus photo, we can't see a much difference between the two, other than subtle orange hue in the right eye. But when we do an OCTA of the right eye, we can see multiple interconnected branching vessels in a spaghetti appearance confirming the diagnosis of diffuse choroidal hemangioma. Coming to the glial cell tumors, so this is a 13-year-old kid with known case of tuberous sclerosis. This is a small astrocytic hematoma. 
On OCTA, we can see that there is hardly any vasculature, probably very scant vasculature. So it is also well known that the small astrocytic hematomas associated with the tuberous sclerosis tend to have very less vascularity. It also does correlate with the fundus fluorescent angiography, where we can see a minimal hyperfluorescence in the venous phase. So the OCTA does correlate with angiography in such cases. In contrast to the small retinal astrocytoma, in this case we can see that this is a large retinal astrocytoma which showed progressive growth over the last few years. On OCTA, we can see that there is abundant interconnected vascular network. The intervening signal void areas are quite more when compared to the vascular tumors because these tumors are solid. But what about this? This, this is definitely a grayish, this is definitely a yellowish white lesion which is abruptly elevated from the retinal surface appears to be intraretinal on OCT. So probably a glial cell tumor, is it an astrocytoma? But if you do an OCTA, we see that there is no vascular signals within the lesion. So it points to a diagnosis of a non-neoplastic lesion, probably focal pseudoneoplastic gliosis of the retina. So OCTA can help us in differentiating a neoplastic lesion from a non-neoplastic lesion. Coming to the pigmented tumors, so this is a fundus photograph of an optic disc melanocytoma. On OCTA, we can see that the melanocytoma, the entire tumor is seen as a signal void area. There is hardly any vasculature which is seen. This is probably due to, as such, the low vascularity of the tumor and also the fact that they are heavily pigmented and they may be casting the shadow. Coming to the choroidal melanoma, the problem with imaging the choroidal tumors is the presence of these extensive projection artifacts from the superficial retinal vessels. But we, if we ignore these choroidal, uh, this, this projection artifacts, we can still make out that there are a lot of tumor vessels which are fine and small caliber when compared to the choroidal hemangioma. So here also we can see it's predominantly small caliber vessels when compared to the choroidal hemangioma. So this tumor, yeah, both are pigmented tumors over the disc. When we do an OCTA, it shows that it is, dense, it is densely vascular, the vascularity is abundant, suggesting the diagnosis of a juxtapapillary melanoma, but this, we know it is melanocytoma of optic disc. This tumor, when compared to other choroidal melanomas, which I showed in the previous slide, are definitely, the vascularity is quite very well seen in this case. This is probably because the juxtapapillary melanoma usually grows around the posterior edge of the Brooks membrane and they come into the superficial plane. So there is no overlaying RPE or other retinal tissue which can obscure its visualization. So OCTA definitely plays a very good role in understanding the vascularity in the superficial tumors than the deep tumors. So coming to, a choroid, coming to choroidal nevi, uh, the two images on the left, we can see that there is no overlaying RPE hypertrophy, but here we can see that there is a definite RPE hypertrophy over the nevi. When you do an OCTA, we can see that in these two tumors, the signal is bright corresponding to the nevi, but here the signal is dark with slightly vascular, with scant vascularity seen within. There are a few papers comparing the and there are a few papers which try to understand the OCTA characteristic of the choroidal nevi. Some say that they are dark and some say they are bright. So in what we assume is probably it depends on the overlaying RPE changes. If there is an RPE atrophy over the lesion, probably it shows as a bright signal due to unmasking. And if there is an RPE hypertrophy, in this case what we can see, like there would be uh, masking and it could be seen as a signal void area. That is what we assume. We don't know whether it's true. But we know that the vascularity within the nevi is not much altered normally. So the vasculature itself will not be contributing to this appearance. So to summarize, in cases with vascular tumors, OCTA could identify presence of small retinal capillary hemangioblastomas, which can be missed on clinical examination. A wide, when, whenever, when we get a wide, wide field OCTA, we will be able to even identify the peripheral tumors probably. It helps in diagnosis of an endophytic juxtapapillary retinal capillary hemangioblastoma, which can be usually confused with a pseudopapilledema. 
It can also help in identification of subtle diffuse choroidal hemangioma without the need of an angiogram. So coming to the glial tumors, it helps in differentiating the neoplastic and non-neoplastic glial tumors. And in cases with pigmented tumors, it definitely helps in differentiating a juxtapapillary melanoma from melanocytoma of optic disc, particularly when the melanoma is small. The limitations of our study are its retrospective nature, small sample size, and definitely further studies are required, and further series are required to improve our understanding about the OCTA characteristics of intraocular tumors. Thank you, one and all.